Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. And today's show is going to be featuring a guest who's been on many times and hopefully will continue to do so on this show as long as it exists. And that is Daryl Enka, who is renowned for his channeling abilities and his longstanding connection with a being named Bashar. Bashar is an interdimensional being who imparts wisdom and guidance on various aspects of human existence. Daryl Anka's work as a channeler has spanned four decades. He's also a filmmaker, an author. He's also co-owner of an LA-based escape room with his wife, Erica. So a little bit about the show, Dare to Dream podcast, won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. Well, Magazine listed Dare to Dream as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It is high ranking under self-improvement on Apple Podcasts. And I was recently notified that Dare to Dream won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards under three categories, inspiration, self-improvement, and spirituality. Thank you to everybody because the show is growing so much these days. So I know this subject resonates with you. I am grateful that you're on this journey. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do energy work out in the world. If you would like to become a facilitator or take a class, go to drdanehere, H-E-E-R.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility specialist. I am a book writing coach. I also take author's books to a guaranteed international best-selling status, and I do all the heavy lifting for the author. And finally, I teach you how to be interviewed on radio and podcast and get massive results. If you would like to learn how to become way more visible with what you do out in the world, I have a gift for you, templates, how to message yourself, how to get there, and some of the steps to take. Go ahead and grab your gift. Go to debbie-dashinger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. My guest, Daryl Anka, has for 40 years channeled the remarkable multidimensional being known as Bashar. Bashar describes himself as an extraterrestrial being from the future, a contact specialist who is specifically involved in preparing Earth for extraterrestrial contact. Perfect timing. To learn more about Daryl, go to DarylAnka.com. And later on also, you will have the link for the Conscious Life Expo where Daryl and Bashar will be speaking coming up soon. And with that, I welcome the amazing Daryl Anka back to Dare to Dream. It's great to have you. Thank you, Debbie. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here again. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. And, you know, as I'm reading your bio, I'm like, oh, Bashar is here to prepare us for extraterrestrial contact. Voila. Yeah. This is upon us. Uh, when last I got together with you, we had this conversation about when will first undeniable contact occur. And it's been four or five months since I spoke to you about that. And I know a lot is changing rapidly in the mm -hmm. earth. So what, what is the latest on that? What are, are there new predictions or senses about when that will happen? No, there's still the idea that the general window of contact is sometime between now and maybe 2033 or 2040, although um, re relatively recently, Bashar did say that there may be an over 90% probability of some kind of major UFO event at the end of 2026 or the beginning of 27 that would be strong enough to start changing our understanding that they exist so he's not really forthcoming yet about why that happens how it happens where it happens exactly what it is that's going to happen but he's basically saying something about that event will allow us to know we're not alone mm -hmm. as a contact specialist is Bashar only involved with humanity 
and preparing us for extraterrestrial contact? Or is he also involved in other planets, other beings? Yeah, he, he deals with many different civilizations. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not the only ones. Um, <clears throat> so he's talked about a few of the other civilizations that he is in contact with, some of which are really fascinating. Um, so yeah, he, time for them is not the, quite the same as it is for us. So it's not exactly linear, like he goes from one civilization to another. He can handle several different things simultaneously. Um, so yeah, he's in touch with different civilizations. What is the nature of your relationship with Bashar, Daryl? Does he call on you when it's time to communicate? Do you call on him sometimes? Is it both ways? And do you feel somewhat blended with him? Yes. I mean, I'm becoming more and more my version of him, so to speak, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why either in this year or the next year, I'm going to actually do something I did before, which is start teaching classes as myself mm -hmm. to really allow people to dig deeper into a lot of Bashar's principles, like the formula, you know, because when he does a 90 minute public session, it's not really giving the public a lot of time to understand a lot of the principles thoroughly. So I found that uh, a few years ago, I did uh, a class that was like an eight week course, um, eight, one day a week. And it really allowed people an opportunity to really grab hold of the concepts and, and understand them uh, and apply them in their lives uh, more concretely, so to speak. So I'm looking forward to doing that again. I'm excited about that class coming up, and that'll be on the Bashar.org website when we have decided to go ahead and, and do that. Um, so now and then I'll get kind of a hit from him that there's something he needs to say, mm -hmm. and we'll set up a time for him to talk. But more often than not, he's simply open to the idea that when when we have created a schedule that works for us, he'll be there. Uh, again, because time for him is not what it is for us. And sometimes he's even said that, you know, he may already have had the conversation, but it plays out in our timeline after he may have already had the conversation. So it's not always even real time in our understanding of that term when he's talking to us. Um, so it's quite a weird interdimensional thing how they can manipulate uh, space and time to be able to communicate what they need to communicate and it will go to exactly where and when it needs to go whether they're doing it in real time live or not mm. i was thinking today that if i when i leave this body and this life if i have a choice about what to do with my next level of incarnation i was thinking it would be pretty amazing to be a wisdom being, to come through somebody on some planet and help people much like sure. Bashar is. I've never thought of anything like that before, but I thought, wow, what a cool job. Like I'd yeah. be down for it, communicating, helping, guiding. Yeah. I think I think many beings do choose to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's certainly available to us. <clears throat> so, I mean, you ask the idea of what's my relationship to him. I mean, in a sense, you know, again, this gets a little mixed up because of our understanding of linear time and the idea of his multidimensional nature. From his perspective, everything is simultaneous. Everything exists at the same time. So to say, you know, linearly, you could say he's my future self. But since we coexist simultaneously, it might be in some ways a little bit more accurate to say we're both simultaneous extensions of the same oversoul one in this timeline one in his timeline so he's in a parallel reality but again because of the flexibility of his consciousness and where they're at in their evolution they know how to communicate to other aspects uh, of the same oversoul that he may be an extension of one of which i guess would be me so you know, you can say he's in a parallel reality, you can say he's a future self, but it's probably more accurate to say we're simply two simultaneous extensions of the same oversoul. Mm. Well, you turn out really well in the future, in case you were wondering. <laughs> well, thank you. But that's, see, that's what I'm getting at. It It's not me, it's him. He's a separate being. 
I'm becoming my own version of him in this timeline. So it's only the same being on the most, on the highest level, let's say on the oversoul level, we're the same being. But as individuated extensions of the oversoul, we're our own autonomous souls, we're our own autonomous individual being. Mm -hmm. Well, happy new year to you and Bashar. Happy and year. I have a sense, I mean, I'm excited about this year mm -hmm. to start with, but it feels different than any other new year has ever felt to me. And I feel like this is a ramping up. That's the best way I can describe it. And I don't sense that it's going to stop, that this is like going into the rest yeah. of this year and the next year. What, what's happening energetically and what kind of shifts are going to be coming about that are new for us this year? Yeah, your feeling coincides perfectly with what Bashar uh, just recently delivered as the pre-record for the next public session on Zoom, because he has said this is the beginning of a new cycle, that he's now going to focus on the idea of preparing us for contact in a variety of new ways, that he has called the Interstellar Alliance Social Experiment. This is the year of contact, or it is the countdown to contact year one. So there's going to be a series of things he's going to start delivering to people that are very different than what he's done before, that actually, I believe, if I understand his concept, will call upon us to start taking certain actions, physical actions in our lives that would allow us to be more vibrationally aligned with becoming a member of the Interstellar Alliance that he belongs to. So he has said this is going to be very different. He has said not everyone necessarily needs to do it if they don't want to, because I guess the suggestions he's going to make might be challenging for some people because they might not, let's say, be typical in our society. Uh, he's not talking about breaking any laws or anything like that, but he's talking about taking actions that may allow people to really start acting a little differently and being engaged with society in a very different way. So he's delivering step one next time, not this time. This time it was simply the announcement to prepare us for the fact that he's now entering a new cycle. We're entering a new cycle. He's going to do things differently from this point forward. And then after that, step one will be delivered as to what is the first thing he is suggesting that we do to start aligning ourselves with the vibration of the interstellar light. So I'm really interested in looking forward to what he's got in mind for this because it sounds very different yeah okay and for those of us who want to follow that as each of these steps unfolds go to bashard.org and sign up there and then we'll get notifications right right everything that bashar is going to do will be posted on bashar.org so whether it's the monthly zoom sessions that we do or whether it's an event that we're doing you know, somewhere else, like in Sedona or something like that, it will all be listed on Bashar.org. Okay, excellent. And so thus far, there are no processes, there are no procedures that he has shared that we need to focus on. We need to wait a little, or is yeah, there anything in other words, you can... Yeah, in other words, this, this pre-record, which will air in another week or two, um, <clears throat> will be a preparation. In other words, just letting us know that something is changing letting us know that he's now delivering different information, letting us know that this is ramping up to contact and he's starting a new cycle of information after 40 years. Mm -hmm. Because to him, 40 years is the typical human society cycle in which things massively change. Because if you, if you look at a lot of 40-year cycles, you will see that a lot of really abrupt changes happen in societies after 40 years. So he is letting us know that this is the beginning of a new cycle from when he started channeling to us mm -hmm. and that he is just, he's just giving us time to sort of let it sink in, prepare us for the fact that he's about to deliver new steps, new actions, new information, new suggestions. Amazing. Uh, is there some kind of extraterrestrial visitation history that explains why now why now and the ensuing to come years 
why are we at this place of soon to be open extraterrestrial contact? Well, I think it's just a result of our exploration of consciousness, our evolution, arriving at a point where we're starting to realize that we may not be alone in the universe. We're starting to discover exoplanets. We're, we're extending our understanding out to the stars. Uh, and basically, in a sense, our curiosity is taking us into other stellar neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So they recognize this as a turning point in our society, in our consciousness. It's to them like extending an invitation. But again, they have to respect how we decide to do it. They can't just show up because they know it would be too disruptive to our society. They have to give us time to integrate the information, to get used to the idea that we're not alone, so that we raise our vibration and we can, in a sense, meet them halfway uh, to um, you know, assimilate and integrate into the idea of our place in a larger galactic family. So they're just recognizing that's what's happening now, because we are at the end of certain cycles, of time and we are beginning new cycles of time as i think has been predicted in many different cultures this is like the beginning of a new era a new world in many cultures around now so i think he's reinforcing and confirming that that's true uh and helping us take advantage of that new energy that new cycle in moving forward i was so curious um because i'm thinking about what you're sharing daryl and the word our right, collectively. And we all know we're in a tribe. We believe in extraterrestrials. We believe that there is definitely, and no, there's life outside of this planet. But there's a whole contingency of people who have no sense of that, who are mm -hmm. eye rollers. So yeah. what is it for them? Is this going to be like a big wake up, like, hello, this actually exists, here you go. Or is it that they are creating their own reality and timeline when ours may go a different direction? Well, I think both are true. So in other words, there may be some that are creating a timeline where it's okay for them to suddenly wake up to the realization that we're not alone. Others may not wish to do that. They may be on a completely different path. And as Bashar often says, there are an infinite number of different parallel versions of Earth that already coexist. Mm -hmm. So we never change the planet we're on, we change ourselves and we shift to different versions of Earth that are more representative of the choices that we're making. So I'm imagining that means that some people will never have extraterrestrial open contact. They will simply exist on a version of Earth that goes down a different path. And there will be those that choose to be surprised by it and wake up. And there will be those like you're talking about where we know this is happening and it seems inevitable to us that this will be the logical extension of our continuing to shift through versions of Earth that bring us closer and closer and closer to the idea of open contact. Because certainly, in an infinite array of parallel versions of Earth, there is already, or are already, multiple versions of Earth that are having contact. Hmm. Another thing that Bashar reminds us of is that for a lot of indigenous cultures, American Indians, a lot of African tribes, uh, so on and so forth, uh, open contact is already a fact of life for them. They already know their ancestors from the stars exist. They've been interacting with them for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Quietly, yes, out of the mainstream of Western civilization, but nevertheless, they have their stories and their assurances that they've been interacting with these beings throughout their history. So, when we say open contact, we're really only talking about portions of Earth's population that have been sort of shut off to that, uh, who are waking up to the fact that they've always been here and they're already interacting with many different cultures on the Earth, just not the ones that have been focused in a certain way until now. Yeah, absolutely. And I love this about indigenous cultures, I think it's fascinating. They haven't had to talk about it much. They just be exactly as they be. However, right. this has been a fact of their life and acceptance right. of their life, these relationships from the stars. Right. Yeah, they consider them our ancestors. So mm -hmm. there you go. <laughs> and have humans been impacted by DNA throughout our history? 
Well, I believe so from the very beginning. In other words, as the story goes, which Bashar has kind of confirmed, Homo sapiens is already a hybrid. So in other words, a long time ago, an extraterrestrial race introduced their genetic material into a naturally evolved hominid that evolved on the earth, like Homo erectus, and actually created Homo sapiens. And that's that's really the translation of the biblical story of the creation of man, is that the gods actually created man in their own image by injecting their DNA for whatever their purposes were in doing so, and have been sort of overseeing and watching us ever since as we evolve. So I would say humanity is already hybridized. Bashar has said and again, you can only take this, you know, with a grain of salt because I have no empirical proof of this, but he has said the naturally evolved being on the earth is Sasquatch. In other words, they were the ones, the lineages not genetically changed by the extraterrestrials. So that if the extraterrestrials did not come to earth and inject their DNA, what he's basically saying is at this point, we would all be Sasquatch but we have been created to be something alien to earth in a sense um and so while sasquatch branches still exist they sort of keep their distance from us because we're not really from their point of view the naturally evolved beings of the earth we have connections to the stars we're different than they are um and then of course you have the whole what's called you know the alien abduction experience with the grays that are obviously doing some things to create other versions of hybrids and tinkering with our DNA and so on and so forth, as again, a part, according to Bashar, of our human evolution. <clears throat> One thing I think is interesting about that is, you know, we have many different ideas about how evolution occurs, uh, you know, natural selection, mutation, so on and so forth. But an idea that Bashar introduced is that there actually are races in the universe that are almost functioning like honeybees in terms of pollinating different other species with different kinds of DNA to evolve them as well. So in a sense, the greys have been functioning that way to create a hybrid being or a group of hybrid beings that will eventually, according to him, come to live on the earth that we will mingle with that will allow Earth to become what he terms the sixth hybrid race. So part of our evolution as humanity is to actually have beings that interact with us in a way that alters our DNA so that we can evolve in a certain direction, that we have agreed to this on a spiritual level, whether we remember that or not. And it's simply a natural part of our evolutionary path on Earth. So it's a big story. It's a wild story. Again, no proof yet, but eventually, according to him, the hybrid beings, the hybrid children especially, that are the progeny of these alien abduction experiments, uh, will come to live among us on Earth, and then, of course, we would have all the proof we need. Amazing. So, if I understand correctly, the Sasquatch are interdimensional beings. They can be on this Earth, but they can also portal to other planets. Is that correct? Or other dimensions of Earth. It doesn't have to necessarily be another planet. It's what Bashar has referred to as slipwalking. They can actually just, they've evolved to the point where they can slip in and out of different dimensional levels of earth. In other words, Bashar is saying earth is kind of like an onion. There's a lot of layers to our physical reality that we don't know about and that you can actually slightly shift into an alternate layer of physical reality that is different than what we consider to be our typical daily physical reality. And they have evolved the ability to do that to avoid interaction with beings they don't want to interact with. And you know, it's so funny. I am realizing, like, how did I know that? And I realize it's because of your book, Shards of Glass, because one of the characters is a Sasquatch yes. who does portal to other yes. dimensions. And yes. so isn't that great? That's like, yeah, well, I mean, I, I based that on what Bashar's information was all about. So there are some things in that series, Shards of a Shattered Mirror, that are based on some of the things Bashar has said, some of the things that 
a future hybrid named Willa Hilla Crissing has told us about in my channeling. Uh, it's about maybe 10% of the book is based on what we consider to be real information from these beings. The rest of it is science fiction just for the purpose of telling a story. But nevertheless, it contains a lot of the principles that they have shared with us through the channelings that I've done. Great. And thank you for the correction, because it's a wonderful book for folks who have not yet read um, Shards of a Shattered Mirror. And you've got a one and two I've read. Yeah, Are two there more? Exist. I'm halfway through the third one. It's just taking a while because I have other things that are, you know, pulling my attention in different directions. But I'm I'm doing my best to uh, finish the third book. I know there are people that are waiting for it, which I deeply appreciate. Sorry for the delay, um, but I am getting to it as quickly as I possibly can. Okay, and then you're talking about the grays uh, hybridizing, and it sounds to me like this sixth race will be a homogenized race. This will be. It sounds like a blending of many different types to create something new that may yes. not be as different as we currently are on this planet to one another. Well, I don't know that they will necessarily or that homogenous is the is the correct word to use, because I don't want to give the impression that Bashar is talking about us all looking the same. I don't think he's saying that. I think he's saying it's a more unified uh, civilization. But it's also based on appreciating and validating the differences in all of us. Yes, we will be different in general when we start mixing with the hybrids. And we may have some uh, increase in similarity. But I don't think we're all just going to look like the same, like we're punched out of a cookie cutter. So, um, you know, he still is is saying, you know, to value the differences. That's what really creates unification is that everyone is being their true self uh, and the differences are what allow us to appreciate all of the variation in creation. What's going to be happening? Can you offer any specific insights on changes that are upon us, such as war or disasters or consciousness shifts that are coming down the pike? Uh, I Well, I've been talking about consciousness shifts to some degree. I can't really offer a lot of information on the other stuff because Bashar does not do predictions, nor do I, uh, unless he feels that there's so much momentum behind it that it's unlikely to change. So that's why he's saying, you know, there may be a, some kind of a... Um, UFO event at the end of 26 or 27. Uh, he rarely does this. And the only other two times I can just pull off the top of my head is I know that in 1998, uh, and it's on one of the recordings we have, that he said that before the end of 2001, New York would be hit by a terrorist attack. And he also said that in 2016, you know, before 2016, he said that after 2016, everything would change politically which obviously it has quite a bit. Um, so the fact that he's actually saying there may be this UFO incident of some sort at the end of 26 or 27, he usually doesn't do that unless he feels there's so much energy behind it that it's unlikely to change. That doesn't mean it's impossible to shift, but he feels it's unlikely to change. So we'll see. And, you know, that may have obviously a profound effect on everything else going on on earth it may make people wake up and take a look at us and say you know we need to do things differently now that we have this to consider so we'll see what the effect of that is and the other thing that's interesting is he's not really saying why that happened so i'm not even assuming that it's because we're suddenly all peaceful and and you know singing kumbaya it could be the result of all the negativity going on and maybe something will happen that will force them to show their hand uh, to prevent something worse from happening. I don't know. So all I know is the incident will be an opportunity for us to change, but I don't know exactly what brings it about. It's just that the timing is obviously important. Mm, that is a an awesome point of view because I've been holding on to the idea that when something that is seemingly so negative, such as the war, well, there are many wars, but I'll just use the one in the Middle East right now. 
And I know it greatly impacts people and sensitives, right? And my sense with so many things that have been coming up for us, like in our faces to look at, is that they're coming up to be healed, to be paid attention to so that different choices can be made. Yeah. I mean, again, you can use even the most negative things in a positive way if you learn lessons from them and do something to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Now, you know, how many people learn those lessons? We don't know. Not necessarily a lot, as we observe, because we keep doing the same things over and over again. Um, but again, it may be that we reach a point where something so different suddenly happens that we really are forced to take a look at ourselves and what's going on in the universe in a different way. And so we'll see what happens at the end of 26 or the beginning of 27. Um, again, uh, that's something that Bashar does rarely. So I'm looking forward to finding out what that actually means and how that plays out. I know that you and I live fairly close to one another, probably about 20, 30 minutes apart. Mm -hmm. How safe do you feel living here in Los Angeles and Southern California? I feel fine. <laughs> I feel perfectly fine. I, I don't focus on the idea of needing protection because in a sense that vibration invites the need for protection. I just know that synchronicity will guide me where I need to be when I need to be there. I've been in this spot now for uh, almost 30 years. I'm perfectly happy here. <clears throat> um, so I just pay attention to the signs and I follow them as best I can. And so far I have no signs that I need to be anywhere else. Yeah, that's great. Cause I, I know there's many other people out there talking about the safe spots. Um, yeah. And... But if that's the person's belief system, they may need to follow their intuition and go to where they believe they would be safer. But right now, I'm feeling perfectly safe where I am. Yeah. When open ET contact occurs and there is an exchange of wisdom and technologies, Daryl, do you have any indication of what the first technologies are that our cosmic brothers and sisters will share with us? Well, I'm assuming a lot of it may at first have to do with how to better support humanity in other words how to feed humans how to heal humans how to take care of ourselves uh, a lot of it may have to do with more spiritual perspectives of loving ourselves loving one another so i think some of that has to be a foundation first before they're willing to believe that we will be capable of handling bigger technologies i think eventually We'll get into things like free energy. I know that one thing Bashar has always said uh, quite often is that one of the gifts that ETs would present to us in open contact at some point would be a record of our entire history, things that are missing from our history that we don't know about. You know, things about Atlantis, things about Lemuria, things about other civilizations that have been on Earth that we may know nothing about. So I think that he has said one of the gifts is to give us that understanding of what all of our connections are, what kind of history has, has happened here uh, that's relevant for us in our shifting forward. So that, um, that would be interesting just to learn about all that information that's been lost or hidden for so long. Yeah, many years ago when you were on this show, I believe you mentioned that Bashar was working with scientists, maybe NASA, on free energy. Was that true? And if so, what is a, the status? Yeah, in a manner of speaking, not, it's mm -hmm. not anything official. He has had private conversations with certain scientists about free energy devices and other technologies. They are in the process of building such things. He has, up to a certain point, guided them with steps along the way. Last report is some of them that have been willing to go all the way forward with that have been seeing signs of some results of what's called overunity in those devices. In other words, they put out more energy than they use up. It's on a very small scale, but again, he's making us take baby steps just to learn the principles before he allows us the information that would build bigger and bigger units. 
But again, he's just guiding us. He's not doing it for us. And at a certain point, he has stopped giving that information in order to allow the scientists working on it, the technologists working on it, to discover certain things themselves. He's taken them to a certain point, and now he's saying it's there's a period of time where they have to figure things out, and how they do will determine whether or not he needs to come back in and continue to guide them. Fascinating. So is that somewhat of an ongoing relationship in that they can reach out at some point and well, say- I Again, they always have the ability to contact me and say, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. But again, right now, Bashar has sort of stated this is a spell where they should not do that for a while. Mm -hmm. So they need to figure things out for themselves up to a certain point. He will, in some sense, you know, when, when and if they wish to report where they're at, determine whether or not he should come back in and continue to guide them. But right now he's saying you need to find out these things. I've taken you to a certain point and you need to figure the rest out up to a certain point yourself. Otherwise you won't really learn what this technology is all about. You'll just be, you know, mimicking and copying things with no understanding of the principles involved. Yeah. Makes sense. Like a good teacher should. Yeah. yeah. You know, I really hope that med beds are one of the things that are delivered or explained or shared very early on. Um, my understanding of them, the ones that are actual cosmic brother and sister technology are phenomenal that you can yeah. lay on a bed and literally have, you know, incredible wounds and situations yeah. healed immediately. Yeah. According to Bashar, it's all about resonance. It's all about frequency. It's all about energy patterns. It's all about vibration. It's kind of what Tesla said. It, you know, he understood when you understand it's all about frequency, you'll unlock the secrets of the universe. So we just need a bigger understanding about the idea of energies at certain frequencies and what kind of effects they actually have on physical matter. And Bashar's talked about that a little bit, uh, mostly in the realm of science rather than in the realm of medicine, though he's hinted at it, uh, because he has to, you know, see, this is one of the things about being a first contact specialist is you have to kind of honor and respect the laws of the land. And he can't give medical advice mm -hmm. because that would go against what our society says an individual that's not a doctor should do. Mm -hmm. So he's given hints, he's given some ideas about what it's based on and how to kind of go about experimenting and exploring that idea, but he's left it at that doorstep because he just can't say, this is what you do to cure cancer. This is what you do to, you know, cure diabetes. You just have to understand the principles and start experimenting to find the answers on your own. Mm. But he's what about, what do we have that they're interested in? Are there things that extraterrestrials would like and benefit from earth, from humanity? Well, yes. I mean, it, we do things differently than they do. One of the things he has always said is, you know, there are other civilizations that are aware of how we overcome things, how we transform darkness into light, negative into positive, limitation into freedom. They may not have the same degree of that that we do, and therefore they can kind of look at us and go, well, if they can do it, we can do it because our challenges are not as deep. And so we actually are teaching a lot of other civilizations, how to go from very deep limitation and very deep negativity and still be able to be powerful enough to transform that into light and into something positive. So we're, according to Bashar, you know, people tend to think of Earth as a kindergarten, but he said, no, you're a master graduating class. We learn a lot from what you are doing about transforming things in a way that is unusual. So Earth is sort of unique. It doesn't mean there aren't any other planets that sort of have these similar challenges, but Earth is a tough school and it's where strong spirits come to accelerate their growth by facing these amazing challenges and overcoming them or learning from them to move on. So it's how souls grow to use this kind of a class in order to do so. And so, yeah, they learn a lot from us. 
And what about art or music or philosophy? Are those fascinating to them? Yes, our perspectives are fascinating to them. I mean, sometimes they find them a little humorous yeah. uh, because, you know, Bashar sort of said they look at us like, we they understand why we do this, but they look at us like we're a seven foot tall being trying to stuff ourselves into a one foot tall box because we're so much greater than we think we are. Mm. And we don't know that. And we think we're just what fits into the one foot tall box, but we're much bigger. They can see us for who we really are, the strong spirits that we really are. And they're, they're doing their best to get us to realize that ourselves. Um, so yeah, they, they're very fascinated by how we have sort of bent ourselves and twisted ourselves into pretzels, so to speak, <laughs> to do what we do, to experience what we experience here in this density of physical reality, um, because they're not as dense in their dimension. And so it's fascinating to them that, that spirit beings can learn things by doing it this way. Um, certainly, they, they have their own art. They have music as well. Now, philosophy, I wouldn't say they exactly have it, because philosophy to them is interwoven into what they know to be true about how the universe works. So for them, I think philosophy is not separated from, in a sense, science or knowledge. It's one and the same thing, because it's just an understanding of how things work. Um, but they absolutely have art. They absolutely have music, different from ours in many ways. Uh, and they, I think, are fascinated by our art and our music as well as expressions of our reality. So sure. Oh, what I would give to listen to their music. That would just be phenomenal. Yeah, he said, he said, we would hear, he said, it's usually on beats of three. He said, we would consider it to be relatively simplistic. We, they have percussion, they have wind, they have string instruments, but they're very simple. However, he said to them, it's not simple because they can hear other chords, other harmonics mm -hmm. that we can't hear. So to us, he said, you might hear three notes they might hear 300 notes. Yeah. So it depends on their consciousness as to how they interpret a single beat of a drum or a single strum of a string. It, it's something very different for them because they see multidimensionally and they walk through this multidimensional reality like a, like a dream. So it's not just a bunch of aliens walking around on the surface of a planet or flying around in ships. It's literally like walking through a spiritual array of different dimensions as their daily experience. And they perceive a larger range of things with their senses than we do. So until we raise our vibration, like he said, they would probably hear their music in a very simplistic way and wouldn't hear all the other overtones that they mm. can perceive. Well, Bashar is from the planet Esasani. And yes. I, I wanna just validate that this is correct. Esasani is the name of the planet but yes. the people are called Sasani because Correct. S means place eh, and eh, eh, eh means place. Eh, eh means place. Ah, the place Sasani. Of the Sasani. Yeah. Eh. And the, or the place of living light. Is well, that correct? That's, that's what Sasani translates to living light. Yes. Because they consider everything to be made of light, to be made of energy. Mm. So they, they basically call themselves living light. That's so beautiful. Mm hmm. And is it your understanding that the Anunnaki existed, that they had a catastrophe 450,000 years ago, and that they came here because this was a habitable planet, but also it was a mining planet specifically that's, for gold? That's what I was talking about earlier when I said an ancient civilization had altered mm -hmm. us to create Homo sapiens. I was talking Not. about the Anunnaki, yeah. Right. And my my understanding of that is that they actually took us from 12 strand to two strand. I just want to get your feedback on this. 12 no. strand so that I we eventually we would become a slave race and do the mining for them. I'm not going to go into the idea of slavery and use that term. Okay. Yes, we may have been workers mm -hmm. for them, but the Labor. idea is well. What Bashar has said is, in physical reality, you can't have more than three strands of DNA in the human being. The idea of connecting to energetic templates of DNA on higher levels, yes, you can connect to four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12.
that doesn't mean they actually physically manifest in you as 12 strands of DNA. You're connecting to energy templates on different dimensional levels. So three strands is all that's physically manifestable in a human being. But that alone would allow you more connection energetically to the higher templates of DNA that exist in other dimensions. So you're accessing the energy. It doesn't mean it actually physically manifests within you. Now, the idea is that when the Anunnaki introduced their genetic material, they may have curtailed certain genetic markers to prevent us from having the same abilities that they had, mm -hmm. like psychic functioning and telepathy and so on and so forth. And just the idea, again, of accessing the knowledge of the gods. Again, going back to the biblical story, they prevented us from eating from the tree of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. So it's the allegory of, yes, we were restricted from knowing certain things. Now, <clears throat> in order to make us more compliant with what they needed us to do. Um, but again, my understanding from what Bashar has said is that faction that did that was not supposed to do that. And they were recalled by the main group of Anunnaki and that's when then they went, okay, well, now that you've created this sentient race of beings, this these homo sapiens, now we have to guide them. Now we have to watch over them for a certain period of time in order to see that their evolution goes in a certain direction. And then we have to leave them alone to let them decide who they want to be. And again, going back to the biblical stories of things like angels, things like being guided out of the desert by the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, UFOs and Ezekiel being visited by wheels within wheels. All these things in Bashar's estimation are vague recordings of interactions with the ETs after the first group of Anunnaki left that now had to watch over humanity to make sure that they were going in a certain direction and to preserve certain kinds of genetics within us that would eventually allow us to open those markers that had been kept dormant as we raise our vibration so that we also can experience more psychic abilities, more telepathic abilities, more conscious awareness and become like the gods. Mm -hmm. And uh, absolutely about them doing something that they were not supposed to do because this is a planet of self-will, right? Yeah, of choice. Will. So Absolutely. if something comes in, a being comes in and makes that choice for us, yeah, that's off it's, path. Yeah, it was an act of desperation because they needed something to balance what was going on on their planet. And they just figured this is the most expedient way to do it because it'll take too long without help. And we have a resource here where we can literally create hundreds of thousands of helpers to make this go faster. But no, they shouldn't have done that. And subsequently, then there were five other extraterrestrial races that donated DNA to us, such there as are... the felines and the reptilians. And I the don't birds. know about that. I don't know about that. Bashar has not talked about that. Uh, the only thing that equates to, in my experience, is that he has said there are five hybrid races but that has nothing to do with what you just asked. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have no information on that. Yeah. Again, again, yes, he had, well, okay, I'll touch on that. I'll, I'll back up a little bit. He has said that, that especially in the genetic adjustments that are done by the grays, there may be minor genetic elements that come from other races that they're using in the creation of the hybrids. And in some alterations of our genetics, of some of the people that are taken by the greys and donating genetic material, there may be the addition of other very small amounts of genetic markers, because you have to be very careful. And this is why the what's called the hybridization program has taken so long. You have to be very careful about what is and isn't compatible genetically. And from what I understand, in the beginning, there there were a lot of genetic mistakes mm. that created beings that were not fully realized in a lot of ways. Uh, I actually know someone who is an abductee who had a live waking experience 
of being taken to a military base where they saw an interaction between a military official and a hybrid. And my friend said that the hybrid's face, there was something really wrong with it. It wasn't, it wasn't well formed. So there are genetic mistakes when you're not really careful about mixing other qualities from other races that are non-human like in with humanity you have to be very specific about how you blend those things mm. thank you i'm very curious about i know one of the things you do outside of being an author and a filmmaker and a teacher and so forth is this la based escape room yeah. I want to know, how did you get into it? What caused you and Erica to become so fascinated with escape rooms that you decided to own and operate one? Well, <clears throat> making indie movies is, as many people know, not the most lucrative business in the world. Uh, and so we were looking around for something that would kind of use the same skill sets, mm -hmm. telling stories, building sets, props, effects, things like that. Uh, but that was more of a regular business, an ongoing business. And at first we were looking at things like the haunted houses that come up every year around Halloween because they do really well. But we wanted something that would last all year long. Someone else, when we were talking about this, said, have you considered making an escape room? And we kind of said, what's that? We didn't know. And so we started our investigation and we started playing several escape rooms. And we said, you know what? This is the perfect segue for someone from the film industry who wants to establish a regular business that uses the same skills, and this business can be ongoing all year long. So we decided to invest in that. We now have uh, our company called Boggled, B-O-G-G-L-E-D, Boggled Escape Rooms. It's in Calabasas, California. Uh, we have one adventure right now called The Key of Destiny, we're building our second adventure called Paradox. Hopefully within a year, we'll be on to our third adventure, which will be the ghost of Blackstone Manor. So that's how escape rooms expand, is to build new uh, adventures all the time. Um, and so uh, anyone interested in that can certainly go to boggledescaperooms.com. If they're interested in playing, they will see a calendar where they can book a day and a time to come with their friends. And it's really a blast. There's so much we've learned about doing this, especially it's so fascinating for us as game masters, watching the people play, <laughs> see the psychology and the approach that different people have to these puzzles and clues in the game. It's fascinating to watch. And they've taught us so much about how to refine the game because sometimes they do things we never imagined they could do and yet they sort of got around things by doing it that way so we got okay we got to make that bulletproof so they can't avoid doing that puzzle right so people are really clever and it's amazing to watch how people figure out how to get through the clues and the puzzles to get through the adventure in in an hour in time to get out uh, so we're having a blast doing it and uh, absolutely invite people to come and have a blast in, in the room itself. So I have to admit, I have never done an escape room. Okay. Can you explain a little bit what it is like? What yeah. I would Well, experience? you're 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 put into an environment, a physical environment, a series of sets that that simulate a different reality. Mm -hmm. It could be that you are searching for treasure. It could be that you're on a starship. It could be that you're, you know, uh, on a pirate ship. It could be that you're in jail and trying to get out of jail. It could be that you're trying to break into a bank. You know, wow. there are so many different scenarios that people have created. Now, ours is quasi-Egyptian and it's sort of mm -hmm. mysterious. <clears throat> um, it's not scary, but it does deal with things that have to do with determining your own destiny. It's called the key of destiny. And so you go into these rooms and there are clues that are disguised as different things in the room. And there are puzzles you have to solve, Ooh. riddles you have to figure out mm -hmm. in order to get from chamber to chamber to chamber to open the door to the next chamber and get through it all in a certain amount of time and recover the key of destiny, which has been lost. So it's 
one way to do an escape room. The one that we're building now called Paradox is the story is an evil scientist has used a time machine to change history so she can rule the world. You, as a time agent, have to go into her control center, figure out what she changed, and change it back to foil her plan and correct the timeline in history. So we're working on that one right now. The third one, The Ghost of Blackstone Manor, will be that you have to help break a supernatural curse that has been put on this Victorian manor that um, rendered the inhabitant uh, as a ghost, and it is trapped the ghost in this, in this Victorian manor. The ghost actually appears throughout the game to give you the hints you need to solve the <laughs> wow. puzzles. And therefore you can, if you solve them, if you succeed, you are releasing the ghost to go on into spirit, to higher spiritual realms. So there's a lot of different ways that escape rooms exist and can tell all sorts of different kinds of stories. I, I think they're really, in one sense, a solid and lasting future of one kind of entertainment that is still mm. growing. They only started really around 2012, but now there's thousands of them around the world. There's, I think, over 40 in Los Angeles alone. Uh -huh. um, but we're out in Calabasas where there aren't really any others. Uh, the next closest ones are about 15, 20 minutes away from us in either direction. Uh, so we've sort of established uh, a presence in the West Valley. Uh, so come and play. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I must. And I know you can come with more than two people, right? You can do you up to have eight. to. I mean, you can do two. It's tough with mm. two. I'd say four to six is ideal. Eight is okay. And we can handle up to 12 um, by adding more puzzles into the room so that everyone has something to do so that no one gets mm. bored. <clears throat> uh, but I would say, you know, six people, five to six people, seven people, that's the ideal team because then it gives everyone enough to do. You can confer and communicate with one another in a much easier way than 12 people all talking at once. Uh, but, you know, we can handle 12 if that's something you really want to do. And one of the things that we actually um, have that a lot of escape rooms do, it's not just the general public and enthusiasts, but it's corporate team building that takes place in a lot of escape rooms. They will come just to give their team a chance to bond and communicate and see what strengths their employees actually have. People have actually been shifted to different departments and promoted based on the way they behaved in an escape room because uh, a CEO can look at that and go, that person's a leader. That person mm -hmm. has problem solving skills that are incredible. So they need to be over here doing this job because that's where their passion is. So it's it's really quite an interesting experiment to be involved in creating escape rooms for that people. That is so cool. I'm I'm yeah. all over it. Boggled. Calabasas. Done. <laughs> I want to experience that. Please come. Thank Bring you. <laughs> and what do you do every day, Daryl? What do you do every day to be Daryl? What kind of ritual or practice do you have that keeps you centered, that keeps you moving forward and available for all that you create well i mean on a simple level i have a superfood drink every morning I, i'm not one who usually eats breakfast per se although i might on the weekends uh but i'll have a superfood drink and that takes me all the way to lunch um but basically i'm working on the escape room i'm either writing something or i'm channeling or i'm doing an interview like i'm doing now um and in just you know i have a blast inventing all the different scenarios, uh, the puzzles for the escape rooms. I have a blast writing either books or scripts. Um, so, you know, and sometimes I just enjoy relaxing and, you know, watching movies and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, um, there's a possibility coming up where we may be able to do a true alien abduction story in the near future as a film. So we're looking forward to that. We're attempting to get it funded uh, at this point. But I do all sorts of things. I, I mean, I, I long before Bashar talked about, you know, following your passion, in a sense, that's what I've always done instinctively. I've never really done anything except for one six-month stint as a bank teller when I was really young that definitely proved to me that that was not my passion. <laughs> uh, and from that moment on, I've always done things that had to do with art or creative expressions, and it's always supported me. So I, I strongly encourage people 
to follow the formula and follow their passion because if you really do it precisely and you apply it properly, it really will support you. Mm -hmm. Well, I know we're grateful that you do. And upcoming, you are speaking at the Conscious Life Expo. That's February 9th through the 12th, 2024, held at the LAX Hilton Hotel. Right. I'll be on Sunday the 11th, I believe, in the evening. Great. There is a link in the show notes for those who want to come and hear Daryl slash Bashar on Sunday. Do, does Bashar ever give you a sense before CLE of a theme that he wants to talk about, or does he just allow the questions to come and then he does the sharing? Sometimes. If, if there is something, I will usually get some kind of a hint so that I can give people the title. But beyond that, I usually don't quite understand exactly what he's going to say until he says it. And certainly nothing to do with the question. The questions are all live, immediate, and he just answers them as they come. But yeah, sometimes I'll get an inkling of what the, the subject is he wants to cover so that we can uh, advertise a title. Um, but I usually don't get much more than that. Mm -hmm. What else do you have coming down the pike this year? <laughs> Wasn't that enough? <laughs> Sedona, I know. Oh, yes. In terms of uh, Bashar channelings, yes. Uh, we will be in Sedona in March. Um, <clears throat> I believe we are going to be, yes, at the Sedona Ascension Retreat on Saturday, March 9th from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, being put on by those lovely people there. I think that's um, Suzanne Ross. Yes, and mm -hmm. Alan Steinfeld. Mm -hmm. uh, that is correct. And I think right now we have something that we're talking about also doing in Sedona, but that's way down the road in January 25. Uh, there is a possibility. Last year we did uh, the disclosure event in Las Vegas. Um, and so they may be doing that again. We, we haven't heard that yet, but, um, I'm assuming they want to put that together again, and we'll probably be there for that. We will probably be doing our own Sedona event sometime in the fall, maybe in September as well. And, uh, now and then we have a, an event that we're going to do with Gaia in Boulder, Colorado. And I believe that is uh, I'm actually that, being flown out there myself. Yeah, that's um, in October. On a, October 26th, Saturday, October 26th, we're doing an event at Gaia in, uh, well, I think it's actually Louisville, but it's near Boulder, Colorado. Beautiful. Right now, that's what we have coming up. Plus, you know, not only do we do the monthly short things, but now and then we do small groups like from japan six people at a time for 90 minutes we do a few of those sprinkled out through the year as well to give uh japanese people access to bashar to ask their japanese questions. people are incredible i know when it comes to this information they are so much further on the uptake than americans are certainly and they love this material yeah yeah i uh, am um i'm being flown out by george nori's team to be interviewed okay on great. Beyond Belief on Gaia TV. Any great. advice? They're a great group of people. You'll love them. Uh, no, you, you just have fun. They're, they're, they're really good at um, presenting people. They're really good at treating you well. Uh, they're very sweet people. <clears throat> Excellent. Well, they've been stellar so far. Yeah. Daryl, what do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams or goals? Well, like I said, we have this potential uh, alien abduction movie based on a true story coming up. And I think it's a really important film uh, to, again, further the idea of uh, open contact and the impact that this might have on humanity. So I'm looking forward to that uh, once that gets funded. But I think it's just continuing, like I said, right now with the Bashar channelings and also the escape room that that really takes a lot of our focus to build those things out. Um, you know, I'm I'm usually the one that builds the puzzles, and my wife Erica and my sister Jen are usually the ones that paint them. 
So it's kind of a family affair and it does require quite a lot of attention. So I'll be doing that for a while. Beautiful. So we send people who are interested over to DarylAnka.com or Bashar.org, or you can check out Buggled in Boggled Calabasas. Escape. Yeah, BuggledEscaperooms.com. BoggledEscaperooms.com. Daryl, thank you so much for coming on again today. Thank you, Debbie. I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. Thank you so much for having this particular venue. Mm, my pleasure. And I'm going to end the show today with this quote from Bashar. Everything that happens in your life is a gift. If you treat it that way, you'll experience it that way and spend the rest of your life opening up presence. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment and share. I read them all. And next week, I'm going to be interviewing Shaman Durek, who's a sixth generation shaman and author of the bestseller, Spirit Hacking. Shaman Durek, you don't want to miss that conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today on Dare to Dream. And remember, there's some information and steps coming down the pike from Bashar about ways that we can align ourselves with what's to come 2024 and beyond, and with finally becoming part of the galactic family. Thanks for joining us today.